Uh, so thanks everyone for coming tonight. It's really wonderful to be here for the second lecture of our um, forum lecture series. And I'm really glad to have Moshin Aliari here, uh, Persian, uh, New York based Iranian Kurdish artist, uh, using 3D simulation, video sculpture, and digital fabrication as a tool to re refigure myth and history. Through archival practices and storytelling, her work weaves through complex counter narratives in opposition to the lasting influence of Western technological colonialism in the context of Swana, Southwest Asian, and North Africa. And North Africa. Her work has been part of numerous exhibitions, festivals, and workshops at venues throughout the world, including the New Museum, MoMA, Centre Pompidou. Venice Biennale de Architectura and Museum for Angewandte Kunst, among among other um, among many others. I should I should be able to read it, but I can't remember it. Yet, so I'm sure. um, she's a recipient of the United States Artist Fellowship 2021, the Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors Grant 2019, the Sundance Institute New Frontier International Fellowship 2019 and the Leading Global Thinkers of 2016 Award by Foreign Policy Magazine. Her artwork, in the, the artworks are in the collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Current Museum. She has been featured in the New York Times, BBC, Huffington Post, Wired, National Public Radio, Pocket, Art Magazine, Freeze, Rhizome, Hyperletic, and Al Jazeera, amongst many others. And if you haven't uh, seen it, you should uh, check out uh, the Art 21 episode on Moshin, it's so special. Um, Moshin, I'm so grateful that you joined us here. Uh, when I started my teaching career in 2013, you were one of the first speakers uh, at Purchase College, and I was so stunned by your meticulous work, your investigation, thinking about history, archeology, span um, racial justice, and also technology. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing Thank your you. work. And I'm so glad that the students will get to spend some time with you uh, tomorrow at New Uh You with uh, their practices. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me also. You are an inspiration. I'm excited to be here to also learn from you today and tomorrow. Um, so, yeah. Hi. Um, for today, I kind of um, want to like focus on um, Kind of like three body of work that I have been um, working on in the last like seven years. Um, my work as an artist like really falls in this space between history and technology. Not thinking about technology as something that only belongs to the future. Not thinking about history as something that only belongs to the past, but a much more um, interwoven connection and perhaps non-binary connection between between the two. Um, in my work, I use different medium, different tools. Um, those are just ways of conveying what I want to do with my practice. Um, although I am very invested and interested in technological possibilities with the, the tools that I use, but um, I also always look for the reasons um, asking why am I using that specific tool? What what the use of that tool adding or changing? Um, or um, kind of bringing some necessity to, to the work that um, I'm making. So I want to start from a bit of a recent project that um, I worked on called um, Moon Faced or Mantal At, um, which goes back to um, this uh, dynasty, this, this um, kingdom in Iran around 350 years ago, um, known as Qajar Art. Um, Ajar dynasty, and then their art known as Ajar art, uh, which is historically um, known for their kind of genderless, gender bending queer um, presentations of both beauty of gender and also the way gender was um, presented. Obviously, none of the contemporary ways that we think about gender at a time was categorized or thought thought about, you know, in a way that we understand it now. But it was a much more fluid. Um, relationship between uh, thinking about the beauty of men and women and also um, from these like paintings as I will explain more and more you will see kind of um, again the, the queer um, aspect of them 
Um, so within this time, um, you know, this is starting at the beginning of 19th century, and again, these these paintings or these like definitions of beauty um, are very specific. Um, and then as we go toward the end of 19th century, um, you see a big change in the way that um, women and men are presented. So, you know, this, these are like some of the most favorite wives of the king. As you can see, they have mustaches um, and then unibrows. If they didn't have, I mean, you know, if, if you're Arab or Iranian, you know, we're like very hairy. But um, if you didn't have enough hair, if you didn't have enough, mu enough mustache, uh, you would draw it, you know, as a way again to kind of like um, be presented as like more more beautiful. Okay. Um, and then the same thing for men. When you look at the portraits of of men, um, they are um, kind of portrayed as like more beautiful if if they have a if they have a thin uh, waist or kind of like more like feminine elements within their body. Um, and so again, like what happens as you look at this. This, this dynasty, uh, toward the end of 19th century, this starts changing. So then uh, you start seeing now kind of a different set of um, portraits and paintings that are much more defined in terms of their genders. And there's a lot of studies of like what, what happens between the beginning of the 19th century toward the end of 19th century with this change. And one big element is the westernization of Iran. For the first time, you know, the, the, the kingdom is like opening its door to the West. Um, the Iranian painters are getting like inspired by European painters, realistic paintings. The te uh, camera technology enters Iran, which means that then photos get taken and then changed um, again based on these other notions of understanding beauty within European standards, which is a much more gendered way of thinking about a woman being beautiful with, with these elements, much more closer to how you know, the contemporary world sees it um, now and then how men are considered beautiful. So um, I was experimenting with this um, AI library at a time. This is like around like last year, uh, which is a library called uh, VQ Gen Plus Clip. Um, which are two separate machine learning algorithms um, that can be used with generate uh, to, to generate images based on you know um, phrases that you give it. Um, and I was trying to kind of undo this history of westernization and colonization of these portraits painting and then recreate um, portraits that are once again um, you know gender um, um, not say not once again not not gendered in that way are kind of like, again, like more and more queer. And this was a very interesting process because as you perhaps know, you know, with these AI libraries, they're already like very biased in terms of the data that they have access to. So I was like really trying a lot of like trial and errors in terms of understanding how the library works, like what kind of wording I would give it and what, how it would respond to those like wordings. I was pulling material from an archive of these um, images, portraits of Ajar dynasty, and then um, trying to, as I said, undo or repair this history of westernization of, of gender definitions um, and presentations. Uh, and sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't work, but what the images that you kind of see here or the video that just played are kind of examples of things um, that worked. So, yeah, I, I present this piece um, also like as an installation separately, uh, but that's something that I like to also do with my practice, which is to kind of like build things that are like digital and then bring them into also physical places as separate, separate installations. Um, yeah, I'll just move through this one more time real fast. One thing that was like really interesting was um, again with a very like biased way of these these but um, machine learning programs kind of like understanding language. If I would put like a sentence that was like you know um, a, a a gay or like a lesbian couple doing this or that, all the images I would get with, but they had so much like rainbow in it, you know, which is like oh my god, are you serious? Like can you just give me something like more creative? So I had to get like more creative in a way of like talking to the machine to kind of get it what I wanted to get it. So like not use like certain words that would give me these like very stereotypical understanding of you know queer or whatever. Um, okay, so I'm now going to move to a next body of work, which is a longer project called Shiusi's the Unknown. 
um, that I started working on from 2017 to 2021. This is a very research-based project, um, and it has many different components. Um, you know, it has an archive, which I will talk about, and specifically, it has um, five main figures that I like, focus on. The project is um, kind of about going back and looking at um, different mythical stories um, in which uh, there are figures that are either female or, again, like genderless, queer, um, that are not talked about or forgotten, or their stories are um, underrepresented within Arab and um, Iranian cultures. You know, growing up in Iran, we, you know, we, we, we love poetry and literature and like, you know, day to day kind of storytelling is like full of these like mythical stories. And also in our school, we study a lot of myth um, stories. But one thing that was very common was that always, pretty much always, the figures that were introduced, the stories that were introduced were always about these like male, male heroes or figures. And I was just like curious about the stories that did not fall into that space. I mean, I guess the American version of it is like, you know, Superman and Batman and all these like male figures that are like presented as the heroes. Um, so I wanted to kind of like find from old manuscripts, again, stories that were forgotten or um, misrepresented. And within that process, I kind of came up with a word and um, kind of this methodology that I was calling refiguring or refiguration. So refiguring as this process of going back and through refiguring the past or reshuffling the past, being able to refigure or like find alternative ways of thinking about now or, or the future. Um, and as I said, as you can see here, there is, there's like five figures that I focused on. And today I'm only going to talk about three of them, but feel free to check them out more um, in my, in, on my website. So for each of these figures, which are each a gen figure, um, does, has anyone heard how many of you know what the gen is already? Some of you, some of you, okay. Okay, so I mean, all of you know because it's the, in, the actual English word is genie, which I <laughs> it just like ruined all the beauty of the word actually gen and what it actually is because it's, you know, the Aladdin genie. Um, but jinn are these like basically spiritual creatures that are talked about in the Quran as um, these smokeless, um, from made from fire spirits that are between human and non-human. They're monstrous and 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 um, human. And in the Quran, it said that you know we have um, angel we have that you know obeys. We have devil that disobeys. We have humans that have the will to obey or disobey, and we also have jinn that very similar to human can obey or disobey. And there's a lot of daily like stories about jinn. Um, in a way that people talk about their encounters with a jinn, people talk about stories that they heard from other people about encountering a jinn. And one thing that is like very specific about this is that the way you would know if you have encountered a jinn is, um, you know, you might see a jinn and it can be looking like a human, but if you look at their feet, they have hooves and not human human feet. That's how you know it's a jinn. And you can befriend them to possess other situations or other things, or you can be possessed by them, right? So I found this kind of very like hybrid possibility of what the gym is very like fascinating, you know, in the same way at a time I was like doing a lot of like reading on Donna Haraway, which maybe some of you know who wrote the cyber manifesto, in which the figure of the cyber becomes, you know, kind of this um, channel into, um, deep, you know, kind of like um, decolonizing or like thinking about patriarchy, thinking about the relationship of like feminism movement with technology, et cetera, et cetera. And I was interested to kind of like think about, okay, what could be like other examples of this if I thought about, you know, what, what, what would be the cyborg of the, the, of the Middle East, you know? And I was kind of like exploring these ideas around the jinn as this, again, hybrid figure that like has these possibilities. Um, plus I was like focusing very much on um, the figure of the monster, monstrous, right? The jinn being again, this, this figure that has the possibility of monstrosity. And there's a lot of writing, there's a lot of research around monstrosity in relationship to feminism. If you're interested, for example, you can read, you know, works of someone like Rosie Bray Dotti, who's written a lot about this. Um, 
But kind of with that, like what happens if you embrace the monstrosity, right? Like how can you turn around power structures if you embrace monstrosity? Um, and I am just going to talk about also like this notion of utopia and dystopia, which was a place that I was looking for, you know, building work that kind of existed between two because I was not interested to only imagine a utopian place and I was not interested in only imagining a dystopian place. But how can we arrive at these places that are neither nor that can change based on whose utopia we're talking about, whose dystopia we're talking about? You know, when someone like Elon Musk talks about um, going to Mars and like colonizing Mars or like whatever, who is that for? Who will go and who will be left behind, right? So, and these questions always come back to me in my practice in terms of thinking about access, in, in, in terms of thinking about knowledge um, and uh, ways of building stories. Um, and I like this Arabic with collective quote, which says we need to engage with this token fiction that extrapolates from the white, able-bodied, colonial, heteropatriarchy that structures our world. And I think um, with my Shibu Sizya Non series, each of the five figures that I told you, they have their own installations. I, I use, you know, old, I find like old illustrations of them. And actually, I forgot to include, the, let me see if there is one further down. I just want to show, in this, for example, this one, but like with Huma, um, which, um, you know, in, this is like illustration of Huma from Kitab al Bolham, which is a 14th century um, Arabic uh, manuscript. And I like kind of use these illustrations and and then 3D model my own sculptures and then 3D print them and build installation shrine-like spaces for each of them. And I also write a new story about each of these these figures. Um, so as I said, I'm not going to talk about all of them because kind of I, I won't have time. But I will focus on three of them. This the this is the one that is called Kabus. Um, which is a gin known to uh, create um, nightmare and specifically sleep paralysis. Has anyone ever experienced sleep paralysis? Do you know some of you? Yes. Um, it's when, okay, I will explain what it is. Maybe you don't know, but maybe you've experienced it. It's when you are having basically a nightmare, your body, you can't move your body, your body gets basically paralyzed or numb, but your brain is still processing. So you can't move your body and you kind of have this um, kind of, almost like you see yourself from outside. It's, it's really horrifying. I've had it, I've, I've experienced it twice in my life and it's just something that like never left my brain after I experienced it because it's like super intense. Well, the mythical stories about this and this happens to be like actually a very common spirit that is talked about in a lot of um, African cultures and stories, and also, you know, Middle East is very common, the name Kabus, uh, which specifically actually the, the name means nightmare. Um, and when she comes and sits on your chest, you basically are possessed by her. But when I was doing this, I, I was also like looking at the scientific reasons for it, because I was trying to build a story around that. And the scientific reasons for it is very much connected to stress and trauma. So they did all these studies actually in Syrian refugee camps and um, you know Denmark, and they like went around and like talked to people at, at, at the refugee camp, and so many of them had experienced um, uh, um, you know this experience of kabus or sleep paralysis. Whereas like in Denmark, people are like, what is that? Like we don't know what that is. Like we we've, we've never heard about it. It's very so connected to stress and trauma. And so I, I um, made this piece, which I will show you like a three minute excerpt of it, but I made it for a VR experience, um, which doesn't do really justice when I show the 2D video. And um, I made built an installation for it. So as an audience, you come and you enter this room, which I kind of created it in the same way that uh, my, um, uh, like the, the way that my bedroom in, in Iran was. Um, and you lie down on it and you wear this headset and you get taken to this space where then the story of four generations of women, like my grandmother, my mother, myself, and an imagined monstrous human daughter is told. And these are stories about war, um, you know, Iran-Iraq war, which was eight years. And um, it ended when I was four, but I still have like memories of it. And um, I also collaborated with my mom to make this piece because um, around like 12 years ago, 
um, she gave me her diary, and this is a diary that she wrote during the war, and um, in part of the diary is when she's pregnant, and she is asking if it's a it's a um, right idea to give birth to a child during a war, you know, and if that's a cool um, idea, you will see some of it that I've included. So I had her like read from her diary, and so I'm talking about intergenerational trauma, um, blood memory, and kind of. Um, within the tradition of this kind of writing that I do with this, with this, she was his unknown series, um, imagining the way to break from the cycle of intergenerational trauma is to give birth to something that is non-human, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what I propose with this storytelling. Um, so again, if you would like at any point to see a more complete version of these, because I'm just showing excerpts today, uh, feel free to email me, and I'll send you the link and the password, and. To do this. See. Your name is the My name is the most important. Secondly, that I put in there. Secondly, to the first one, but I'm not going to do the second thing. Secondly, cheese. also mention is that it is happening in a bathhouse because it was um, a place that you know it's, it's a place that is known as one of the favorite visiting places of jinn where people encounter jinn because jinn like to come to places that are dark and humid 
And um, also because these public bathhouses used to be like very important in Iran as a place of like women coming together to hang out, right? Because people didn't have like private bathhouses. So they would go to a public bathhouse like twice a week or something and it would be kind of like a ritual. Like they would hang out and gossip and sing. And so it was like a very intimate place for like women. And so I kind of like imagined it at a place where like, again, like my grandmother, my mother, myself and this imagined daughter come and like have these conversations or, or tell these stories. Um, okay, now I'm gonna move to Homa. So and this is another figure which uh, is a jinn known to bring uh, fever to human body. Uh, Homa in Arabic actually means uh, fever. And um, I was kind of interested in her story because I kind of saw a possibility about thinking about heat, the heat of the human body, and then the heat of, you know, extended to the heat of the planet and the global, uh, you know, climate crisis. Um, but also thinking about the language that gets used, the, the solutions of climate crisis that ha has been, you know, forever, like dominantly very like Western, right? Um, like the, the ways to kind of, again, like respond to how, how we can get out of this, um, but also the troubles that different places are into. Um, and obviously the, the, the percentage that, the, that um, first world developed, whatever countries have, part have had in um, this kind of creating a climate crisis in the first place. So I was imagining Homa as a jinn that comes and creates some kind of justice, brings some kind of justice around the issues of um, climate crisis, global warming. And I really like this quote because I think it kind of does a great job of thinking about apocalypse or like apocalyptic situation, which is that um, the apocalypse is combined and uneven, and it is within this reality that political choices have to be made and sides taken. I, I made this work um, in at the end of 2016, and you know, whenever I would talk about it, you know, I would talk about like how whenever we experience any kind of crisis, you know, there is always going to be inequalities in a way that we experience that crisis, you know. And then when the when the COVID happened. Um, I had a friend that wrote me and she was like, you know, I, I feel like this is like another way of, we have to like get some kind of help from Huma because not only because she brings fever to human body, but also because of kind of what, what happened with that reality, which is that um, we were not all together in it as it was, it was repeatedly said, but rather based on the country you were in, based on how fast you had access to vaccine, based, based on what kind of household you lived in, even in the US, whether you lived in a household with like roommates or other family members, how would that change your day-to-day -day experience versus if you were just living with your yourself or with your like, you know, primary family members. Um, not to just mention again, like other countries and the kind of um, troubles that people were in, which was like much more harsher than some the ways that it was experienced in like again like developed countries. So whenever there is crisis, whenever there is apocalypse, there will always be injustice and inequalities in the way that we experience it. Um, and so I will play a little bit of the story of Homa um, and then talk a little bit about that. In the whole universe, there was none better. None whom she, Huma, could not best. She leads all the burnings, looking up from the sun. She is a demon with three heads, two identical, vaguely equine, one looking right and the other left, leveled within an infinite horizon to see the disaster above her. The third head faces forward, above the other two, looking into the future. Her open legs with bent knees and open arms, suppressing all creatures. Great in respect, a monster in her form. She's the sight of the warm globe and the slowly burning human. Her three talismans are encountered frequently, one to simply summon and invoke her, to call and conjure her, chanting her name seven times in a row. 
She enters from the most unforeseen openings. She bubbles up and out of the deep, dark bowels of the earth, forcing the heat of the desert to all she will possess. In favor of the rotting and heated bodies, airs, rocks, and oceans. Um, and again, just a quick excerpt of this. Um, but okay, now I want to, since I don't have much time left, I kind of want to quickly talk about the laughing snake, the last figure, which is known as a snake that, as you can see, illust is illustrated again in another old manuscript. Um, she's known as a as a snake that is like very powerful. She's, you know, the story is that um, she's going to different like towns and cities and killing different people and animals and um, winning all these like battles. And no one knows what to do with her until someone comes and says um, the only way to kill her is to hold a mirror in front of her. And as you can see in the old illustration, there are these like men holding a mirror in front of her. And the story is that when she sees her reflection in the mirror, she laughs for days and nights until she dies from laughter. Um, and in the tradition of She Who Sees the Unknown, I didn't want this, the story or the way that I was in, trying to interpret the story was that her laughter is not a position of a weakness, but like rather a position of power. So her destroying her body is her way of taking, um, uh, you know, ownership of her body by, um, you know, removing it from that reflection in, in the mirror. This is her sculpture, which is 3D printed. It's, it was actually out of time, the biggest thing that I 3D printed. It's um, 25 inch and, um, this will be actually um, in a show at the Whitney opening um, that next week. It'll be up for four months um, with, with the story that I've written about her. So I connected her story to um, kind of uh, thinking about street harassment, sexual desire, um, and kind of my relationship with my body, like growing up in Iran, but also like a larger collective experience of, you know, um, sexual experiences and also street harassment in Iran. I made this work in 2018 and um, it takes a form of a web art, um, hypertext project. So you have to, you know, look at it on, on your laptop and it starts from a linear story. And as you click on more words, it becomes more and more non-linear. And it starts kind of with a more of a personal ex stories and then becomes more collective, become more, becomes more imaginative. Um, and it's kind of crazy because now visiting this work, again, I made it in 2018, and with everything that is unfolding in Iran, with the woman life freedom um, revolution, like it, it feels even more like relevant um, as when you enter kind of like the, like um, get closer to the end of the storylines, um, you know, again, there's like not just one layer, but like a bunch of layers within chron chronologically. Um, and there is like a part that I talk about um, a revolution, like uh, for like women as this like collective stage that I'm imagining. And then now I, I recently just like revisiting it, it, it just feels like so real and so relevant. Um, and I will actually, I'm going to do a performance of this and a reading at an event at the Whitney, if you happen to be in New York in April. But, okay, now to come to the other part of my practice, uh, which as I mentioned, I'm, I only focus on, you know, kind of like two and a half body of work, which I will explain the half one now. Um, but also so much of my work is about thinking about how do you as an artist get out of, you know, just... The, the white walls of galleries and museums. How do you get out of like your, your studio practice as an individual? Something that has been always very important for me. I don't come from a background that is um, traditional art. I come from a social science background and media studies background to the art world. That was my undergraduate degree. Um, and so it's been always important to think about how to connect other worlds. You know, I think about my practice as bringing history, archeology, span politics, um, gender studies, like all these things together and like also really trying to get out of, again, just this experience of presenting a work as an installation or um, as a video piece. So with whenever I show my work, this is just for like, for example, She Who Sees the Unknown, um, I think about those questions. And one thing that I've been doing with this body of work is to build these um, reading rooms where people can come together and like read and, and 
you know, participate in the research that I'm doing. This includes material that I'm gathering and it, in, it includes um, images that I was gathering. And I was doing this, as I said, this body of work was a five years work, which also is my preference of how I like to work. I like to like really focus on one thing and like really dig different aspects of it, build different um, mediums and, and platforms for it. So as I was developing this work, I was also, um, you know, developing this art, this reading room and people could come and again, have access to it, but also events that I was um, putting up with that. And within that, this is um, 2015, when I was actually working on another body of work called Metro Speculation Isis, in which that I developed after um, this concept of digital colonialism, which I define it as a framework for critically examining the tendency for information technologies to be deployed in ways that reproduce colonial power relations. Obviously, you can think about so many examples of this, right? Like in our daily life, ways that this happens to us. But I was specifically focusing on cultural heritage and access to, um, you know, digital data. And this was, I will really quickly say this work, it's um, a work called Materials Vacation ISIS, where I reconstructed the artifacts that were destroyed by ISIS members um, in 2015 in Mosul in Iraq. Um, and inside the sculptures, I embedded uh, flash drives and memory cards in which I also included all the research part of the project, PDF files, information about the artifacts that were destroyed, my email correspondent with historians and scholars as I was gathering this material because it was kind of a little bit of a shed show when this happened um, because the museum was underfunded, understaffed for so many years um, and they didn't even know the name of some of the things that were destroyed or there was like not correct information about them. So to figure all that took so long and I kind of wanted to make sure that that information is embedded into the sculpture like time capsules. So in the future people could have access to them. These are just five of them, there's 12 of this work. And then I extended it to these three heads that were outside of the museum and were also destroyed. And with that, um, you know, you can plug in the USB and then get some of this information. But as I was developing this body of work, I I was seeing, um, to, again, the context is 2000, 2016, there is a huge um, suddenly, you know, raise in technologies like 3D printing, 3D scanning. And there are all these tech companies that are just like using these technologies, going through the safe parts of the world or whatever, trying to conserve and you know, save the cultural heritage of other countries. But then, and I was like watching this kind of unfold in front of my eyes and because I was doing this project and this project, you know, kind of like went viral when I did it. So people would like text me, have you seen this project? Like this tech company is doing blah, blah. And I was like really curious about what is happening to this, to these scans that they are gathering. What is happening to this um, information that is being gathered and there's questions of copyright, monopoly of information. So with that, I developed this concept of um, digital colonialism. Like when we see the colonialism of like an object in a museum, like let's say you go to the Met or you go to a British museum and you're like, oh yeah, this was like stolen, right? We understand that when it's about physical objects, but when, when it's about digital, um, now these methods that are like gathering digital scan of um, these kind of, artifacts, which is very common. Like if you look at any of these museums websites, they have they have the scans, but you can't download it, you can't have access to it. And sometimes they even make like perfect replica of it and sell it for like a lot, which is crazy. Um, and I so started writing a lot, talking a lot about these things within again the concept of digital colonialism. Um, you there's a whole I could give a whole like one hour we talk only on this. Um, but if you're interested, I have a lot of material on that on my website. But just to end this with the archive of Shibusis the Unknown. So I was thinking about the same idea of digital colonialism, access to information, access to knowledge. Um, and like really asking this question of like, you know, what is an, an archive is for? You know, who, who is it for? And why? You know, who, who would be the people that I want to give access to? So this, the She Was Easy, I know the manuscripts that I gathered, scanned. It was crazy amount of work. Again, like five years of research. I was like going to libraries um, or like also like working with my friends in Iran, um, scanning material, 
um, that were never like scanned before. And so I was kind of, when it ended and I had all these like really like unique specific scans and also after dealing with so much gatekeeping from Western institutions that own a lot of manuscripts from Iran and the Arab world, I wanted to kind of know what, what, what would I do with it. And we talked a lot about this word of decolonizing, right? Like it's a word that, it's a buzzword, it gets passed around a lot. But you know, when I think about it, um, at least this was a question for me, I was like, what does like decolonizing in practice would actually mean? Like if I wanted to like build an example of this, how would I build that example? So with this archive, um, I kind of, again, also wanted to um, think about access to knowledge. Um, think about this question of like, is open source always good? Is it inherently good? And my answer is like, no, not, not necessarily. Like depends who you're giving this material to. Um, and so with the archive, the way that I built it, um, if you know English, you can have access to the first layer of the archive. So, you know, if you click on different parts of this thing, you get Farsi, Arabic, English listing, which also I work with a historian in Iran to like do like very detailed listing of some of this material that was never done before. Um, and you know there is the PDF you can download, and then there is the, the image library. But then to get access to the second, third, and fourth layer of the archive, you have to know um, Arabic or Farsi. So you have to like put in these cultural codes and uh, a, a mix of numbers and words as a way to like pass through, um, you know, the, the first layer. Um, well, one second, let me try to go through. I can't even get through my own. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So then it kind of goes on and on, and 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 as you get deeper into the archive, um, there's like more material that are like rare or like unique that you know that was very important for me to kind of for people to not be able to have access to. I mean, obviously, if you have a friend, you can cheat the system. Um, I We made sure, I worked with designers and we made sure that, you know, those patterns in the background, it's just some nerdy information, um, but like we made sure that you can't, there is like a couple of apps that you can like, it can translate things for you, right? Like from one language to another. And then that, those patterns like won't let it read the stuff. So, um, and again, obviously, if you really want to, you can have access to all of this. But um, the, the point was that to kind of try to practice, you know, again, when you think about or when you say these words are decolonizing, how can you build like these kind of platforms? And I was like completely like, experimenting with these things, like wanting to see what happens, what kind of response I get. Um, and so when I think about, you know, the, the how I started this, this um, the title of this lecture, which was Becoming with Each Other. Um, so much of the work I try to do is um, to build a spaces that hopefully, you know, other, other people, other artists, or not artists, other people can build on. And that's how I saw, for example, this project, where like, um, if you are from Arab countries or from Iran or Afghanistan, or if you know those languages, you can use this material that I gathered, which took me so long, um, to then build other works, to give free access to this material, rather than just keeping your research, you know, as something that like is a secret as an artist. I like really believe in that process of generosity of information and knowledge while asking um, who, who we give it to. So I'm gonna stop here, thank you.